Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God, also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. And so as we went through chapter 1, let me remind you, the, uh, the author, the writer has been establishing uh, a theme uh, that you'll see throughout the book of Hebrews, and that is the superiority, the superiority of Jesus Christ. And so as we went through chapter 1, in that chapter, he had established that Jesus is superior. He had said Jesus is superior to the prophets. Jesus is superior to the angels. He has a superior existence because he created all things and he predates all things. He has a superior nature because he is God in the flesh. He said that he has a superior name because he is God's son. He has a superior position because the angels of God are worshiping him. He has a superior destiny because everything ultimately worships him. And so he exhorts us as we move into chapter 2, to pay careful attention to the things that he's been outlining, to the truths that he is teaching. Now, notice he is saying to us that we are to give the more earnest heed. He is saying to us that it's not simply listening, it's not simply hearing uh, what is being said, it's acting upon what you are hearing. It's not just the hearing, it's the acting. There are a lot of people who hear Bible studies and don't perform anything that they're hearing. So it's more than hearing, it's hearing and it is doing. It's like what it says in James 1, 21 and 22, where he said, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. And so that's the reason why as we move into chapter two, he's actually giving what we today refer to as an invitation Now, he's made it clear that Jesus is superior to the prophets and the angels. Jesus is God in the flesh. He's the creator of everything. He is the master of all, and he's to be worshiped. And so what he's saying is, I have told you these things about him. I pointed out his superiority. What are you now going to do with what you know? What are you going to do, in other words, with the information that you've been given? What is your response going to be? How will you respond to this? Jesus, he's saying, is God in the flesh. He's the creator of everything. He's the master. He's to be worshipped. What will your response be to this? Well, he says in verse 1, well, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. So notice he starts out by saying we. In other words, including myself, we all need to listen and pay close attention to what God has said. Now, since Jesus is superior to the prophets, And he's superior to the angels. We need to listen to him. Now, the words earnest heed, when he says pay the more more earnest heed, the the word earnest heed, it's interesting how what that actually is is a picture of it. It it speaks of bringing a ship to land is what it is literally speaking about. That's a way of saying be fully attentive. Don't be just listening. Completely embrace what you're hearing. Again, it's not just hearing, but it's owning the message. That saves us. It's not the capacity to repeat Bible truths. It's the reality of how that's affected my life. In Deuteronomy 4 verse 9, it says, Take heed to yourself. Keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. But teach them to your sons and your sons' sons. So the writer knows that not all who are hearing are are saved. There's a word that is used in the church world. It's called nominal, by name or in name. Those who are nominal or in name Christian need to be exhorted to come to a full and saving faith in Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people, even in this day, when faith seems to be diminishing at a rapid rate amongst the general population, there are quite a number of people still 
who refer to themselves as Christians, when in fact they've never embraced Christ. They've never come to faith in Jesus Christ. They don't read the word of God. They don't witness about Christ to anybody. They don't hardly if ever go to a church service. They don't have any relationship with God, but because they were a baby and they were, they were baptized or because they were raised in a Sunday school or whatever their, their religious history may be, they, they will say, well, I'm a Christian. But in fact, they're not. And so he's speaking to two different people. He's speaking, one, to the nominal, to the person who is claiming to be a Christian. He's saying, listen very carefully. And he's also speaking to the one who is a genuine Christian. And he's saying, you need to pay the more earnest heed. Don't drift away from this. Anchor yourselves in the word of God. Anchor yourselves in the promises of life in Jesus Christ. Because if you're not attached to these things, if you're not anchored in these things, like a ship drifting away from the dock, you can begin to drift away. You can be like a, a ship that just slowly and almost imperceptibly is drifting along with the current. So trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord because he will provide stability to your life. In Hebrews 6.19, he, he will say, and we'll see this, it's in chapter 6, we'll see it in about two years, but in Hebrews 6 verse 19, it says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. And so believers are exhorted to hold fast to Jesus. We are exhorted to be anchored in him. The world has an unbelieving current, and it can silently move us to drifting away from our faith in Christ. So he's saying, be aware of this. Anchor yourselves. Have stability in him. Secure yourself from drifting. Anchor yourself in Jesus. And so how can I know that I'm in Christ and, and what must I do in order to um, be sure that I'm, I'm solid in him? Well, I would ask myself the question, is, is Jesus Christ the foundation of my life? Is Jesus Christ the center of everything in my life? Is he in yours? Is he in mine? I believe he's the center of my life. And I would hope that all of us could say, you know what? Absolutely. My life revolves around, around Jesus Christ. I have a growing desire to know him and, and to be like him. I, I hunger for him. I, I want relationship with him. Like the psalmist in Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2 says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And do I, do I have him as my foundation? Do I have a growing appreciation for and a hunger for his word? Do I, do I read his word? Do I have a desire to obey what it is saying? Again, in John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. So as believers, we know who Jesus is. We know the message that we've received. So we all live through times of pressure, affliction, problems, persecution, and in these days we're to be holding fast to that which we have heard. And so he's beginning with an exhortation, um, give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, the things that I have just taught you, he is saying, the things I've just written to you. Jesus is superior to prophets. He's superior to angels. He's a superior name. He's superior in every way. Listen to this, he's saying. Pay careful attention to this. Build your life on these things. I don't want you drifting away from these things. And he goes on in verse 2, 4, if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And so, where do we stand? Why should we hold fast? Because if we don't know him, there's one thing awaiting us, and that's judgment. There's judgment that will fall on those who aren't standing with Christ. Now, it's interesting, again, how he had made it clear that the word that was spoken was steadfast, meaning God's word is trustworthy. You can take him at his word. Now, I want you to notice something. He says that this word was spoken through angels. 
This is a word he said that was spoken through angels, verse 2. Now, what is he talking about when he says that? Well, let me give you a couple of things about this. The Jews believed that the law, the law of Moses, had been communicated through angels. And the law of Moses was binding. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33, verse 2, it reads, He said, The Lord came from Sinai, dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. They understood that to be the giving of the law. And so angels were present at the giving of the law. So when you read in the New Testament, remember the first uh, Christian martyr, somebody named Stephen? Do you remember how in chapter 7, verse 53, when Stephen was giving his defense when he was about to be martyred, how he said, you who have received the law that was put into effect through angels but have not obeyed it? He was referring back to the law that, was come, that came through angels. In Galatians 3.19, Paul says it like this, the law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. So the law, though from God, he is saying, was communicated through angels. Now, that would make the law inferior to the gospel because the gospel was given to us directly. It didn't, it didn't come as a complete revelation, uh, this law of Moses. It didn't come as a complete revelation, but it was binding. And so even though it didn't come in a direct result as Jesus who preached to us a gospel, yet the fact that it came at all, and even though angels were involved, it still is something that is binding because it was from the Lord through the mediation of angels. And even so, verse 2, even though it came through angels, every transgression and dis disobedience received, he says, a just reward. Now the law is very strict. It tolerates no offense. It punishes all transgression. And the punishment that is meted out for being broken is just. It's completely fair. And so in the Old Testament, if you broke the law, you were held guilty and you could not escape judgment. Again, in the New Testament, the book of James, which was written to Jews also, in James chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, he said, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you commit adultery, but do not commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. See, that's why it's just foolish to say that you keep the Ten Commandments. Because nobody ever has. And, you know... I, I I kind of had a running list in my own mind before I came to Christ. And I, and I kind of like had, I had taken the requirements of God and solidified them into the 10 laws, the 10, the 10 words, the commandments. And so, you know, I, th I was doing pretty good, but I broke like nine of them. And so I thought, well, I'm, I'm still holding on to this one. Um, and then I, then I got saved and I read James and James said, no, if you broke one, you broke them all. Why is that? Because God's standard of entrance into the kingdom of God, into heaven, is perfection. And none of us are perfect, right? So God's standard of entrance is perfection. That's why I needed a savior. That's why I needed somebody to, to, to take my punishment on himself because I was, I was ready for judgment. And so the result of breaking God's law, he says, is just. The word just speaks of something that's righteous. It's, it's proper. It's a reward. It's a proper penalty is what he's saying. And so with all of this, verse 3, then how shall we escape if we next, uh, neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? How shall we escape? If God was severe under the law, uh, what is he going to do uh, now that he's given us his son? How, how shall we escape? If we neglect, that word neglect means to make light of, to regard as being in, uh, having no value. So what he's saying is this, and this is, is an important thing. When he says, how shall we escape? He's actually giving an invitation to those who are hearing his words. Those who are being read this epistle. He's calling the people to respond. He's saying, Jesus Christ is Messiah. 
I've already pointed out to you, he's the greatest. Greater than prophets, greater than angels. He'll develop that in a moment. So, seeing that the law under Moses, if you broke the law, you would be judged for it. And that's a law that was actually communicated through angels. The gospel came through the mouth of God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And the words that he spoke are binding, much more so in terms of the authority that he wielded. And so how can you escape so great a salvation that's been given to you by what God has done through Jesus Christ? How can you escape that, seeing that under the law, if you break it, you're going to be judged under the gospel. If you reject Christ, you'll be judged. How are you going to be, you know, what are you going to do? If Jesus Christ is Messiah, is the point he's making, you need to yield to him. There is no other way, and there is no other path to God. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says it like this, Nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there is one God. There's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And so God gave his son, and to reject his offer of salvation will result in judgment. And so don't neglect such a great salvation. He said again in verse 3, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So the salvation that he's speaking of is the message that Jesus had preached and the message Jesus had taught. So it was at first, it had begun to be spoken by the Lord. It was spoken by Jesus as he preached and he taught. Now, after his death and his resurrection, he appointed those and gave those a commission, those whom he had appointed, a commission and power. He said to them, go throughout the entire world and preach the gospel to every man. He said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so Jesus gave the message, and he appointed those to go forth and take it to the world. And they did. The apostles preached the gospel, and, uh, and they did it with great confidence. And so as they went out and they preached the gospel, uh, it, it says, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. He said, God gave the apostles not only the commission to go out and proclaim this message, but also empowered them to work miracles. Now, when we went through the book of Acts, we saw that as the message had been preached in various places we see in the early history of the church, God often validated the message by, by miracles. Now, in, in the book of Mark, in chapter 16, verse 20, uh, uh, Mark gives to us this insight. He, he says that they went out, the apostles went out and preached everywhere. He goes on to say, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. And so from the very beginning, after the power of the Holy Spirit had come upon the 120, and the apostles had gone forth proclaiming this message, very often God would confirm his word by the accompanying miracles. And people would see that. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 43, that verse says that many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. When we were in the book of Acts, I'll remind you of another place in Acts chapter 6. It says at verse 8 that Stephen was full of faith and power, and he did great wonders and signs among the people. And so we see that the work of the power of the Holy Spirit was present in the early church and that God moved in marvelous ways. I, I think of the book of Acts chapter 3 with that miracle that took place at what is called the beautiful gate recorded in, in, Acts, in Acts chapter 3 when, when this crippled man who had been laying there and begging for alms and all from the people who would enter in going to the temple. I think of that man when, when uh, Peter and John were about to enter in, how that, uh, as they were going in, Peter had looked at the man and said, look upon us, and the man looking up expecting to receive something because he was there in this place to receive alms. People would go into the temple and very often give help to the poor. So he's expecting to receive something, a, a gift, financial gift, 
That's when Peter said, uh, silver and gold have I none, but such as, as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I say unto you, stand to your feet and walk. And we know the story. We know how he, 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 Peter reached down and, and began to pull him up, and he received strength in his ankles and his legs and his thighs. His, he, he had instantaneous balance, and before you know it, he's walking and he's leaping and he's praising God. And, and, and that's how the Lord had done works in the early days. He he, he moved in a wonderful way, and then the people began to gather around, and they began to look at the apostle Peter, and, and they began to think that there was something special about them. And, and Peter said, why are you looking at us as, as if there's something different about us or better about us? It's, it's not us at all. And then he preached the gospel, and he speaks to him, and he says, it's through faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that this man stands before you completely whole. And so that was a great example of somebody who had uh, performed a miracle and preached the gospel. And in Acts 4, verse 4, it says, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And so miracles... We're drawing the attention of people. And, and so the, the, uh, the apostles had gone forth and they, they had the word of God that was entrusted to them. They also had the power of God and God was performing these works and God was drawing people to himself. And so he's speaking about this. How can we escape if we neglect this great salvation that has been verified to us? Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and, and he... He, he anointed us with the power of the Holy Spirit. We went forth in his power with this message. God has been with us, and the Holy Spirit has been moving according to his own will. So God has, has been bearing witness. So how can we neglect this? Now, after saying that, and that's, that's a question, he's saying, listen, do you believe this or not? And if you believe it, you better hold fast to it. But then he goes on in verse 5 and continues by saying, for he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man, that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Now, it's almost as if he's switching gears here when he says in verse 5, he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. So he's returning to his subject of angels that he already had been speaking of in chapter 1. Now again, he has just urged his readers not to neglect a great salvation. Now he gives us insight into its value. Now he does this by giving insight into to what he calls the world to come. Let me talk to you about this for just a moment. We know this. I'm just going to give you brief things that you're aware of. Angels are incredible creations of God, but man has an incredible destiny. Angels are not going to be rulers in the world. Angels are actually servants. The superior, superiority over man that angels have at this moment, is temporary. It's not permanent. Angels, as you read your scriptures, have incredible power. But angels are not going to rule planet Earth. After Jesus' second coming, he will establish his rule as the king. Now, Psalm 86, 9 and 10 says, All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. In Revelation 1.5, Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings on earth. And so, angels are not going to rule. Jesus is the ultimate ruler, but man has a place in all of this. Notice that he writes concerning 
a world to come. When he speaks of the word world, that speaks of the inhabited earth. When he's speaking of this world to come, the inhabited earth to come, it's speaking of the kingdom called the millennial kingdom. You see that in Revelation chapter 20. The point he's making, once again, is angels are not going to rule. Now, at this time, our present world is under the sway of an angel. Jesus spoke of the enemy as the prince or ruler of this age. Satan is a fallen angel. In John 14, 30, Jesus said, I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming, but he has no, no hold, no power over me. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul said, You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. In 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are children of God, and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. God has not put the world under the control of angels, though temporarily at this point, there is one who is referred to as a ruler or the prince. So at this point, Satan has a lot of authority. But in the kingdom, and that's what we're looking at here, man will assume the role that he was created for. Angels will not rule. God does, and man rules alongside of the Lord. This is so mind-boggling that I've been working on this for, for two days, just this one thought. Now, I'm only going to give it a short one here because I'm going to do more next time we're together. But man is going to rule alongside of the Lord. In, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 12, uh, Paul said, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Revelation 5, verse 10 says, He has made us uh, unto our God kings and priests. We shall reign on the earth. In Revelation 20, verse 4, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. Judgment was given to them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or, on their, or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. You were created to have dominion. We don't understand that. I don't. I've been working on this for, for some time saying, really? But that's what the Bible says, and that's true, and I'll develop that with you. That would mean, in this context, this would mean there can be no argument that Jesus is less than an angel. The fact is, redeemed man is only lower than angels for a short time. We're going to assume the place God intended for us and will be elevated over angels. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 4, if any of you has dispute with another, Dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? He goes on to say, do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? So for a short time, we are in the place of being lower than the angels, but Ultimately, one day, we will rule and we will reign. I'll be giving you more of that next time. That's just kind of a, a taste of what we're going to be looking at. Because he goes on in verse 6, and he says, One testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we are not yet, uh, we do not yet see uh, all things that are put under him. So what he does here to develop and bolster this is he introduces Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is, a, is called a Psalm of King David. 
Now, notice how he begins in verse 6 when it says he testifies, when testified in a certain place. Notice he doesn't cite a human author. He doesn't mention David. But the psalm was well known to them. When you read your Bible, David was a warrior. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. Everybody knows that he had a heart after God. Everybody knows that this man was a warrior. But we need to also remember that he was also a writer. David was a writer of Psalms. When you read the Psalms, there are 150 in the book of Psalms. And Bible commentators say that he wrote no less than 76 of those songs. So he's a songwriter. In 2 Samuel 23, verse 1, it reads, These are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of God, the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. So David was a writer referred to as the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was also a shepherd. As a shepherd, David would be out there sitting in the wilderness. Uh, some of us have been to Israel, but if you can just picture it like this. Go to the desert here in California, which is anywhere. Go to the desert and, uh, you know, where there are no street lights, where there's nothing except natural light, nothing except, we'll say, the moon or perhaps the stars. King David, as a boy, was a shepherd. And as a shepherd boy, watching his father's sheep, he would spend nights in the wilderness. And picture him there by himself guarding the sheep against predators and robbers. And as he would be seated there day after day, night after night, by himself out there watching the sheep, there in the dark, David would think of many things, including, he would think including of how great God is, because he'd look out there, and you've done this, I've done this, when it's been a special clear day, sometimes it's after a rain, and you can look into the sky, and you can see stars, you can actually see all these stars, and multitudes of stars, and it kind of blows my mind, and my wife Marie and I have, more than once we said, just look at how beautiful that looks. Isn't that gorgeous? Look at all. It's just this, all these stars that are, and David would do that. And as David was there, he would think about it. He would think about what, what he was looking at. He, was, he would think of the God who created the universe. And, and as, he began to think, as he began to think of, of the God who created the universe, he, he didn't get puffed up with himself. He didn't look at the star. He didn't say this. He's looking at and he's saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that, that you take care of? And he didn't say, well, when I think about these things, they think of me. He says, when I look at the stars, when I behold the beauty, I think of who you are and I think of how little I am. One of the things. That will help us in our Christian life. One of the things that I think that is sorely lacking in many of us, and we need to turn back to this, is humility. There are quite a number of believers who think we're much greater than we actually are. The place of greatness in the kingdom of God isn't how great we think we are. It's how insignificant we truly are in comparison to him. And when you, when you meditate on the things of the Lord, I'm certain that you're not saying, when I think of these things, I can't help but say to myself how great I am. No, when you think of these things, you see how great you are. When I look at the stars, when I consider these things, the works of your fingers, how you, you flung them into space, you know them by name. The universe has, has been created by you, are the Father, the God, you are everything. Uh, it, it humbles us in, in, in this incredible creation. And this is what David is pointing to in this psalm. God, you actually gave us dominion over this? Man is... Simply a dot on an insignificant little planet. What is man? What is man? But God, you think of us when he says God is mindful of man. The word mindful simply means you think about us and you take care of us. God, you turn your thoughts to us. You desire to bless and benefit us. In Psalm 40, verse 5, many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders you've done. The things you planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, there'd be too many of them to declare. God, what is man? 
What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? That's the place of humility. But he goes on to say, you have made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You put all things in subjection under his feet. You've made him a little lower than the angels. Now, mankind in general is being spoken of. Man is physical as well as spiritual. Therefore, we have obvious limitations. That makes us, in a practical sense, lower than the angels. But when he says in verse 7, a little lower, that speaks not only of position, but it speaks of time, space, and even degree. It's referring to a temporary condition. We have temporarily been placed as lower than the angels. But you have crowned us with glory and honor. Now in creation, man is God's crowning work above all other created life. In Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. He didn't make animal life in his image. He made man in his image. Male and female, he created us. So man is the only thing in creation that God made in his own image. And he's not speaking of physical image. He's, been, he's speaking of what is called his moral image. I remember in a Bible study many years ago now, I pointed out that we have been created in the image of God, but that is not the physical image. I said, because there are those who say that we were created in the physical image of God. Mormons say that. They say God has a body. And there are others who will teach that. So I pointed that out. I said, we're created in the, or, mor, uh, the moral image of God. And what people have done, because this is how they'll do it. They'll say the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, therefore he has eyes. The hand of the Lord, so they say he has hands. They'll speak of his walk, therefore he has feet and legs. You know, They'll take scriptures and they put them together, and they say God has a physical body. Mormonism does that, and other, other uh, errors have crept into some churches that would say the same thing. And so I said, but, but the scripture also says that Jesus wanted to, to uh, like a mother hen, put his arms around us. So what does that make him, a chicken? And does that make us a chicken? I don't think so. You know, and I was just, just that's just true, you know, that our, our God is... Uh, is a fire, is, is a flaming fire. So what's he, a blast furnace? You know, and I was trying to show through metaphor the scriptures are telling us what God is like by using illustrations that we could understand. So the hand and the strength and the feet and the eyes and all of that is simply a way for us to be able to understand the God who is invisible. And, and, and I still remember somebody never coming back to the Bible study because they thought that I was that I was uh, mocking their father. I didn't even know their father, but their father taught that, and they got upset by that. So he's talking about the moral image. In Colossians 3, verse 10, it speaks of the new man, and listen to the scripture. The new man is renewed, given a new nature, in knowledge, in the knowledge of God which had been lost, in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Ephesians 4, 24 uh, put on the new man, which was created according to God in righteousness and holiness. So the image of God that man has created him is not in a physical image, but a moral image. Knowledge, righteousness, holiness are ascribed to us as being from God. And so this one who is temporarily lower than the angels, God is going to put in a place of great authority. It says in verse 7, you set him over the works of your hands. He was created to exercise authority. Now in Genesis 1.28, speaking of creation, it says, God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion, have rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so you have set them over the works. You were created to exercise authority. You, verse 8, have put all things in subjection under his feet. So in the original creation, man was established as the one God had given dominion to. But the fall changes this. In Genesis 3, 17 through 19, it reads, To Adam, he said, 
because you listen to your wife. Don't do it, men. Because you listen to your wife and ate from the tree which, about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. So man was given dominion. The fall changed this. And that's why he would say in verse 8, now we do not yet see all things put under him. You see, God intended to subject all things to man. The fall undermined it. Man was not left helpless, nor was he left hopeless. Because verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for a little time. For a little time, Jesus lived as a man. Why? That he might suffer death on our behalf. When it says he was made a little lower than the angels, that's speaking of his incarnation, and there was a purpose for him taking upon himself human flesh. He says it, for the suffering of death. So when taking on human nature, he assumed a rank inferior to angels, his human nature. You see, angels do not die, but as a man, Jesus laid down his life. So Jesus came to lay down his life as a substitutionary death on our behalf. He didn't die for his own sins. He died because of ours. In John 10, 17 and 18, my father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I received from my Father. No angel, and this is an important point that I'm going to just say briefly, no angel ever laid down his life for man. No angel ever did that. Now, why did I even say that, bring that to your attention? You know that. Because Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that Jesus is an angel. They will tell you that. They will come to your door, knock on your door, and they'll talk to you, and they'll say, Jesus is Michael, the archangel. They'll say the name Michael means who is God or who is like God. And they will say that Jesus Christ is actually Michael, the archangel. I could go into this deeper. I won't, but I will say that's an ancient heresy that was disputed and rejected in the early history of the church. And so, when they say that Jesus is an angel, Scripture disputes that. No angel gave up his life. Jesus did. Jesus, for a little time, was lower than the angels. He was fully man and fully God. And he had the ability to lay his life down voluntarily, but also to take it up again, which is what he did. No angel ever did that. Michael did not do that. Jesus Christ did that. And it goes on to say that by the grace of God, he might taste death, fully experience death. Notice, for everyone. The whole human race has been accused. The whole human race has been tried and found guilty. And the whole human race has been condemned to punishment because of our sin. What is the writer saying? He is saying as he had already pointed out in chapter 1, the angels are ministering spirits. The angels are not God in the flesh. Jesus Christ came that he would lay his life down for us. He took upon himself human flesh to fully experience death so that he could take the penalty that was mine. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is life through faith in Christ. So Jesus took upon himself human flesh. This is what he's alluding to. He wasn't an angel. He's greater than an angel. He's superior to the prophets and greater than the angels. He took upon himself human flesh and died on a cross. He was buried, but he rose the third day. In that you trust in the Lord through what Jesus accomplished on the cross in providing salvation, 
then make sure that you pay the more earnest heed to these things that you know and don't drift away. For those who are hearing the message as it's being read, and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to come to know him is his point. But those of you who do know Jesus, no matter, and you're going to see this later in the book, no matter what the persecution may be that you're going through and the hardship that you're going through and the trials that you're going through, hold fast and don't drift away because the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for you so that you might have life and you have a destiny that is far beyond anything you can imagine. For one of these days in glory, you're going to rule and reign alongside of him. What could be better than that? What could be better than ruling and reigning? And that's the point he's making. And so the whole human race has been accused and condemned. But he has fully tasted. Uh, this is actually when he uses the phrase that he has fully tasted it. He has fully tasted this in, in that he took upon himself human flesh and he died. He, he died as a, um, a sacrifice for us. And, and he has... He has fully experienced what death is on our behalf because he was atoning for our sin. In Romans 8, it says it like this, verses 3 and 4, what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. So he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Jesus was 100% perfect. He fully and perfectly obeyed every command, every nuance of the law. And because perfection is the demand for entrance into heaven, we can't do it on our own. So God sent his son. No angel ever did that. No prophet ever did that. Only God in the flesh could do that. And in the flesh, Jesus took upon himself my sin, that he could be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world so that I, by faith, might hold fast to him, not drift away and have an, an incredible a future that I'm awaiting to experience where I rule and reign with him. And that is so beyond me. Like I tell you, I've been thinking about this for days, and I still don't get it. Ruling and reigning with him. Ruling and reigning with him. What does that mean? All I know is it's, it's our future. We'll look at this more deeply next time. But when you leave this place, realize what you were created for. You were created in the image of God to do things that bring glory to him. It isn't right for us to live in a, in a way that in any way, shape, or form denigrates our purpose of creation. I was not created to be an entertainer or a clown or some silly person who wants the respect of human beings. I was created to worship and serve God forever and to rule and reign with him. That is beyond me, but that's what we're going to do one day. We are going to be with him, see him face to face, and then we'll understand what he's saying, because I still don't, but I'm looking forward to learning what that means. Let's keep that in mind as we serve Jesus.